Hi, I'm David Ridley. My guest today is Dr. Brian Cavaney. Brian has degrees in medicine and law. That's right, he trained as both a doctor and an attorney. He also has a master's degree in public health. Brian practiced medicine for major health systems. He was chief medical officer of a large insurer, and now he's president of the diagnostics division of a Fortune 500 company. Welcome, Brian. Great to be with you, David. Brian, what are the top things that people misunderstand about medical diagnostics? Oh, so many. Uh, it's often forgotten because it's on the front end of medicine, and it only accounts for maybe less than 5% of the total healthcare dollar, whereas treatments, uh, therapeutics, and surgeries and procedures tend to get glamorized on the back end. There is no such thing as a perfect test, but it's really important to help doctors get the right diagnosis early on. In fact, some studies suggest that for major diseases, up to 20% of patients are misdiagnosed early in the course of their condition. So better diagnostic workups uh, could actually help improve uh, those diagnoses. Speaking of diagnostics, what should the US government have done differently during this coronavirus disease pandemic? <laughs> Well, I will not get political at all, but I will say this will shock a lot of your viewers that uh, surprisingly little, in fact, it's an unbelievably global supply chain. Uh, and really the problem was, was twofold. It was the complete mismatch between the demand for testing and the capacity for testing. Capacity has ramped massively and nearly linearly since uh, March 5th when, when, uh, I, when my company was the first one to get FDA EUA authorization in order to do it. There have been, however, four completely distinct phases of demand throughout this based on a variety of social, political, and medical and other types of factors uh, throughout 2020 so far. Uh, but that has really been the big, the big problem. The biggest disappointment for me, I think, is the fact that for decades, all physicians in America have essentially looked at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention as the single best source in the entire world for epidemiology, infectious disease, and evidence-based research. The fact that it became overly politicized early on due to the media scrutiny around um, whether or not private diagnostic companies were able to do the testing versus completely done at the CDC, I think set back the public's view of the CDC tragically, uh, and it may take a decade or two for it to restore its rightful place as the single best source of scientific information in the world. I think you're being very generous, Brian, or at least I certainly want to blame the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Can I blame them a little bit for being the, being the, 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 the sole um, diagnostics uh, uh, entity early on and not giving more opportunities for the private sector to come in? Hindsight is 2020, and certainly, certainly blame can be shared by lots of different entities at the state, federal level, the CDC itself. Um, However, I think it's a little bit more complicated than that behind the scenes and in the way that they wanted to make sure that the right genomic sequences were used for the original PCR testing methodologies. Uh, and it was just very unfortunate how one of the four reagents in the original CDC master mix was not uh, effective and that uh, set back the whole industry for a little bit. However, as I mentioned earlier, it's an unbelievably global supply chain so even if that had gone perfectly and if private companies had been able to do that early on, it wouldn't have fixed the fact that all of the enormous supply chain factors, the instrumentation, the equipment, the consumables, the reagents, the sequences, the primers, the pipette tips, the swabs, all of the other things that it takes to produce any one given result uh, are made in a very matrixed uh, environment all across the world. And some of the other trade restrictions also were, uh, could be implicated for the uh, perceived delays in improving capacity. Small-minded people like me like to find a villain. And uh, <laughs> I appreciate your point that it's really not so simple. There's no one finger to point in this, in this situation. It's dramatically more complicated than is often portrayed in the media. Shifting gears to insurers. Uh, in your previous life, you were chief medical officer of an insurer. What are the top things that people like me mis misunderstand about health insurance? 
Well, I think a big frustration for me during the six or seven years I was in the health insurance industry, and even more so now, is the fact that insurers in general do an absolutely terrible job of explaining why they exist, both to their own customers as well as to the rest of society. Uh, they, they do so much more than just deny claims, which is the perception of them. Uh, they organize networks. They are the source of much of the innovation within healthcare much of the provider relationships that you see nowadays. Um, they do, a, a, I would say, significantly better job than most public entities at actually determining the quality of provider networks uh, of who, who would be able to be um, a contracted provider. They root out the source of an enormous amount of the fraud, waste, and abuse in the system. Um, and uh, they promote health in many other ways and organize care. It, uh, and in fact, um, there's often a big distinction between the price controls in public health care programs and the private insurance market. However, in general, private health insurers with scale uh, provide discounts of about 50% off the list price of private health care providers which is significant value and cost reduction for the customers that pay those bills. But um, it's often put juxtaposed with the prices in the public systems. That was fabulous. Three follow-up questions, if I may. So <laughs> one, you talked about innovation by insurers. Are insurers innovating? I feel like so much of the innovation is coming centrally from Medicare and Medicaid because they have scale. Are the private insurers really innovating? Um, Quite a few of the things that <clears throat> have been done as a result of the Affordable Care Act of 2010 had already been underway in the private health insurance market. A variety of patient-centered medical homes, primary care innovations, what are now known as accountable care organizations, a host of different risk sharing programs uh, and performance bonus metrics, quality enhancement programs, a lot of that existed already prior to the Affordable Care Act. It just became front and center in the public's attention as a result of it, was given a specific name in the legislation, and then promoted through the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. It's truly a public-private partnership. Uh, both are needed, uh, and innovation certainly comes from both areas. And the, the public systems, of course, have the power of regulatory oversight, so they can make it happen by force of law versus the private market financial incentives that are often needed for private insurers to do it. But there's a tremendous amount of innovation that happens locally in small markets. Um, you know, the entire pay vider um, uh, idea of sometimes small payers in local communities partnering with a local health system to launch its own insurance product, again, pre-existed the Affordable Care Act and, uh, and is able to take a variety of different methods rather than through the kind of unified methodology that the Medicare system often is forced to do because of the, the regulatory oversight. Good, thank you. And uh, another follow-up question, you spoke about the, the advantage of networks. When I think of insurance networks, I think about just limiting my choice. Uh, are they providing some other benefits for me? They can. Uh, they're, you know, in Medicare, basically everyone with a medical license is able to join uh, and they all make the same amount of money. There is absolutely no differentiation based on quality or based on you know, whether it's the first heart surgery they've done or the 10,000th they've done uh, or any of those other factors. Um, uh, health insurance provides the ability to do that. And in addition, Medicare often doesn't make any distinction on quality, except if somebody has done something so egregious that they actually lose their Medicare uh, 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 number. Uh, whereas in healthcare plans, they can differentiate based on cost. They can actually root out some of the physicians that they believe are overutilizing or misutilizing care and, and can create more custom networks for small employers and others in areas that, uh, where different factors have a different level of importance to their decision-making process, whether it be cost versus outcomes versus something else, versus frankly, in some cases, the desire to use local providers versus uh, a wider swath of providers. And so it provides more flexibility to do that based on what the customer's needs are. As an economist, I'm curious about whether there's a study here. So if insurers are effective at excluding the bad docs, would it be the case that docs that are seeing a higher percent percentage of Medicare and Medicaid patients are the bad docs? 
con conditional on what region you're in, where if you're in Florida, there might be a lot more seniors and so a lot more uh, Medicare. But I guess you could dif differentiate between Medicare fee for service and Medicare Advantage. Is that a testable hypothesis, do you think? It, I'm going to be very careful and not over speculate in that regard because you're right, there's a tremendous amount of geographic variation and others for the payer mix at any given provider's office. But, um, but there are some providers that are not permitted in a variety of different commercial networks and that may or may not be a reflection either on the quality they're providing or frankly sometimes just their own personal beliefs in not wanting to participate in commercial providers or commercial payers. And so that, um, you know, it, it's testable, but I think there are a lot of factors you'd have to adjust for and collect data very judiciously in order to make any true conclusions. From that. Well said. I suspect there are a lot of good-hearted uh, docs wanting to serve uh, the needy, wanting to serve Medicaid patients. For sure. Uh, don't want to characterize them as bad docs. Um, something you said earlier was that, that larger insurers are better able to negotiate lower prices. Do we want more concentration in the insurance industry? I would say contrary to popular belief where they are these big, enormous companies that have all of the power, um, from having been on both sides of that equation, I would actually suggest that local hospitals have significantly more market leverage than do the payers, even the very large big name ones that you can all name in any given market by far. And, uh, and, and while you may think there only is a small handful of mega insurance companies, uh, there are thousands of them. Uh, it's a very long tail of small ones that exist. And um, it has just been an interesting thing to observe over the past decade or so. There tends to be a significantly larger amount of antitrust scrutiny on the insurance mergers than there are on the local market hospital and health system mergers that take place around the country. And I think you are seeing quite a significant balance of power in that regard. In fact, some of the, uh, the highly esteemed uh, researchers from Duke have published some good research over the years suggesting exactly that and demonstrating through data the market power of the uh, hospital and health system and other provider consolidation providing them the market leverage to get the price increases that we all see through our higher premiums each year. And if it's research out of Duke, it's gotta be good, am I right? <laughs> it, must be, it must be right. <laughs> Brian, what would Medicare for all mean for commercial insurers? That's an interesting question. Um, and uh, in, in fact, ever since the Medicare program was launched in 1966, it has been completely administered by private health insurance companies since day one. So the only real difference would be taking the insurance company away from the front end, kind of the marketing, the member engagement, the, uh, the name on the insurance card, if you will. But they would continue to do all of the middle office and back office functions that already exist in the Medicare program. In fact, uh, you, know, you and I are sitting in North Carolina. For decades, all of the Medicare recipients in our part of the country have, been, had, have had their Medicare program completely administered by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, which has an entire very large business unit that administers Medicare for this part of the country. That would probably continue. There would be a significantly fewer number of health insurance companies, of course, because there would be a significant consolidation of those back office operations and a reduction in the administrative costs on the front end. But basically since day one, the only real thing that the Medicare program does, I'm oversimplifying, is, is um, determine the prices paid to providers and what is covered. Basically, every other aspect of the administration of Medicare has been performed by private insurers. And I would assume that would continue to some degree and or even be enhanced because of the dramatically larger number of American beneficiaries. And frankly, the, the dramatically larger uh, variation in the type of people covered from a traditional Medicare plan versus now all people in the country. Very interesting. I think a lot of people will be surprised to, to know the, the role of the commercial insurers in government Medicare. Uh, what's a big health policy reform you would recommend? <laughs> I could get myself in trouble in this regard. And I would say there are so many ideas that have been bandied about for decades that maybe I won't pick one of the ones that everybody knows, like uh, moving to value or transparency or single payer versus versus commercial payer, those kinds of things. Um, how about if I pick something uh, completely different? And I would say that 
in, in my humble opinion, one of the reasons why um, we have such a political divide over this is that one of the political parties tends to point to the entire private healthcare system which is about half, so about half of all costs are paid through public systems, about half through private systems. And there tends to be finger pointing to all of the private systems saying that is the source of all of the, the evil and problems. We need to banish, uh, banish that, abolish that, get rid of all of those companies and all of those interests and move to a public system. That's obviously doomed to fail, right? Because every one of those entities has the economic interest to try not to let that happen. However, if you think about the economic interests of everybody in the private healthcare system, they all pay enormous amounts of taxes and they all would like their taxes to be spent dramatically more efficiency, efficiently. So how about if instead of pointing fingers at all of the private healthcare system, we said, look at the unbelievably complicated administrative complexity of the purely private, uh, sorry, of the purely public healthcare systems from Medicare, the 50 plus Medicaid programs, the military programs, the VA, TRICARE, CHAMPUS, the Federal Employee Health Benefit Program, and all of the others. They're all completely different, administered differently. They, they cover different things, they pay different amounts, they cost different amounts. There's incredible complexity there, but yet every single dollar that pays those came from the taxpayer funded base. So what if there was a concerted effort over the next five or 10 years to dramatically improve the efficiency, the clarity and the administrative simplicity of only the publicly funded systems? That is the source of an enormous amount of the work and cost that all healthcare providers have to spend. And now that I'm a large national provider, I see this complexity every day in our own business. Every single Medicaid and other program covers different things and it provide, it causes an enormous complexity to the system. It would uh, dramatically improve clarity if that were improved. And then I would actually even go so far as to suggest if we did a really great job with that and we were able to see demonstrable administrative simplicity, lower per capita costs, and better care outcomes in the purely publicly funded systems, you would get a significant number of the actors in the private healthcare system, namely the employers that are funding most of it, say, I want some of that improvement and I want some of that simplicity, how can I buy into it? And they would actually be driving some of the desire for, for uh, an improvement in that, rather than being told what they're doing now is going to be abolished and illegal and they can't do it anymore. I just think, playing into the behavioral economics, the psychology, and the, just the pure um, uh, self-interest of that would dramatically change the outcome and get to the place where we all want, which is more efficient, lower cost healthcare that produces better outcomes, but through a dramatically different mechanism of getting there. Ryan, that's a fascinating idea. And I must confess, I've not heard that before. So <laughs> this would be, so you would harmonize Medicare, VA, Military, federal employee health, benefit Medicaid. Programs. Yeah, this is millions and millions of Americans, all in currently completely different, fully publicly funded programs. And then, really, if it if it worked well, and you wanted to demonstrate that it could roll out better, think of all of the state health plans, which covers basically state employees, teachers, others in every state, and then often municipalities are left buying their own private. Uh, health insurance policies for the for the police and the uh, you know other local workers if you would then slowly enable them to buy into it and fully fund it themselves from their own current source tax funds then you would be able to um, drive incredible efficiencies across the whole platform again without even touching the private healthcare system and then you would be able to demonstrate uh, those improvements now this has not been tested. This is a completely wacky thing that I came up with, but, um, and I'm sure I'm not thinking of some of the really important unintended consequences and changes in the provider response to something like that, but it would be a fun thing to think through and just see if you could start small and expand it to certain, uh, again, fully taxpayer subsidized covered populations. So this is Medicare for all, dot, 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 government employees, and veterans and it doesn't necessarily have to use medicare as the only base in fact i don't think medicare traditional medicare is the most efficient way of doing things by by any stretch 
However, you could certainly pick one of those. You could do a hybrid of those. But basically, it would be any, any current um, public employee whose health care benefits come from purely taxpayer-subsidized pools of money. Start there, because it's already coming from taxpayer money. If we could make that more efficient and actually reduce the per capita costs of taxpayer-subsidized policies, wouldn't other people be glad that their taxes are being spent more efficiently and we're producing better outcomes? And that would enable you to either cover more of those people, improve the coverage that does exist, or expand that that uh, process to others. And would this include Medicaid? So would states lose some of their autonomy in, in, in Medicaid programs? You would probably have to start at the beginning excluding Medicaid programs because there's such a highly, highly uh, varied uh, both payment mechanism as well as way that those are rolled out. And many of the Medicaid programs are able to partner with the other social services provided at the state level in not just the healthcare benefits. So you probably would start not including Medicaid, but I would guess some of the state Medicaid programs might want to participate if they saw significant improvements happening in the federal pool. And you pointed out that we shouldn't just assume this is gonna be Medicare, there are better approaches than Medicare, but I'm just gonna stay with it for, for a moment. Would there still be essentially Medicare Advantage programs? So everybody would be under Medicare but there would still be the option or, or something like that, but there would still be the option to sign up for a, a commercially ad, uh, provided uh, managed care version of Medicare. I, th I think so. So for example, all of the 9 million or maybe it's 10 million um, people covered under the federal employee health benefit program, those are all through a variety of purely private healthcare policies right now. Um, and as, as you know very well, many older Americans have been migrating from traditional Medicare to Medicare Advantage policies over time. So they're essentially voting with their feet and their dollars that they might like that. And so you could envision some sort of a Medicare Advantage for all while retaining traditional Medicare program for all of those different covered beneficiaries, or maybe even taking some of the best aspects of the federal employee health benefit program with some of the things in the current Medicare structure as it exists. I'm not suggesting everybody has to be on the same exact policy, but if it's the same framework, same rules, and in some cases, even same list of covered benefits, that would dramatically improve the ability for healthcare providers, so doctors, hospitals, labs, and all the rest, to be able to be more efficient in the way they provide the care to their own patients, because there's such a larger swath of their patients with the same basic set of rules and, and administrative um, uh, burdens placed on them, that it might actually make the whole system more efficient just from that process. It's fascinating, Brian, thank you. Uh, that was a big policy change. Any small policy changes come to mind? Here's one, uh, a smaller one. Uh, here's one that's maybe a little more wonky um, and a little bit more inside baseball, but perhaps I think could be really important based on, on however we get our coverage in the future and however that's determined. One of the things that has always bothered me is that the, the so-called move to value-based care has been very slow and cumbersome and problematic. And in, in my humble opinion, among the many reasons that is the case, is that we don't really have a great sense of what is quality health care. What are the, these amazing outcomes that we want to achieve? We really don't have a good definitive organization or agency or methodology for, for doing that. So we end up with basically every specialty medical society coming up with its own guidelines which if you really take a look at them, often suggest the incredible importance of whatever it is that they do within their specialty for any given disease state. And I don't mean that pejoratively, that's just human nature. So I think it would be amazing if we looked around the world at other organizations, whether it be NICE in the United Kingdom or some of the others that other countries have done. And we actually had one, you know, my same I guess my same complaint about how the CDC has been knocked off its pedestal a little bit. I wish we could take, for example, the best of, of ARC, you know, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, of the NCQA, which is a quasi-private organization which tries to come up with quality measures that go into HEDIS measures and other things, and then even the best of ICER, if you will, 
so that we have one consolidated methodology that everyone in the world, or certainly in the US, looks to and says, this is the gold standard for what we believe is quality, what we believe is clinical effectiveness, and yes, even what we believe is cost effectiveness. Because if we all say and pretend that, that, um, that uh, costs are unsustainable in the healthcare system, but yet we are not ever allowed to speak of or do any research on the cost effectiveness of it and use it for public policy making. I think we're kidding ourselves by not suggesting that the private behaviors of both beneficiaries as well as the providers of healthcare aren't using cost measures in terms of the, both their care seeking behavior, their care delivery behaviors, and then the cost problem we have on the back end of it. So if we could have one organization fully funded, fully transparent, no political, um, uh, fully bipartisan, no political overtones to it that focused on those three things and made all of its findings transparent and where the expectation was all research was funneled there on those three main topics and um, health insurance schemes, whether they be public or private, were in some way expected to use those findings as the foundation of their policy making and policy uh, policies themselves, I think that also would produce some significant administrative simplicities in the system and reduce some of the reason why, back to your original question, why health insurance is often viewed so negatively is because often neither the policy beneficiary nor the healthcare provider really has a great sense uh, ahead of time whether a given treatment is going to be covered by that health plan and that causes a great deal of consternation. If there was greater clarity because of one consistent methodology for developing what, what that would be, and then maybe that would feed into what I view as is generally perceived one of the benefits of the Medicare and Medicare Advantage program is that Medicare determines what is covered through a kind of a very explicit benefit inclusion, benefit exclusion methodology rather than the utilization management method of private health insurance. And uh, Medicare Advantage plans, even though administered by private health insurance companies, must cover everything that is deemed to be covered by Medicare. They can cover a little bit more through supplemental programs, but they have to cover at least that basic floor. If we were able to use a new agency and then dramatically improve the very nebulous nature of the essential health benefits program that was developed in the Affordable Care Act of 2010, and then had a more consistent national floor of coverage policies, it would reduce the administrative complexity of private health insurance. It would improve the clarity to both patients as well as doctors what's covered, and you'd be able to have one consistent, transparent, evidence-based uh, way of, of, of following the science. I know that's overly simplistic. All researchers and doctors listening to this are gonna say, are you kidding me? Medicine is so much harder than that and messier than that. I get that. But right now, it's truly the Wild West, and at least this would bring a little bit more uh, central inclusion of, of the data. Yeah, I think that's, in general, I agree with you. I'm a fan of those organizations doing cost-effectiveness analysis like NICE and ISOR. Yeah. My main critique of NICE is that they put too low a value on a year of life. They think a year of life is worth 20,000 to 30,000 pounds or $40,000. That's really way too low, I think, way too cheap. But, um, but in general, I'm a fan. I guess to your point, to your point though, I think if I'm a, a doctor or a drug company, this makes me very nervous because yes, if, if the agency says that stints aren't cost effective for most people, um, I just lost a lot of my business or uh, whether I'm a stent maker or I'm a, or I'm a, or a doc putting those stents in. Right. But I guess both as a doctor and as someone who worked at a health insurance plan, if, you know, if procedure X is truly not effective, but because they have very effective ways of convincing payers to cover it, then the country just paid billions of dollars of taxes to cover something that is not improving outcomes is guaranteed to have occasional negative outcomes up to and including death and people that get perforated from the stent placement or whatever the procedure may be. Uh, and, and so there are significant downsides to that. I am all for 
uh, providers innovating and, uh, and being able to, um, you know, use the marketplace to drive those innovations. But um, not every new innovation is magically better than the, the current standard of care that needs to be demonstrated. But I think one tricky part, and again, being at a national provider who now has to spend an enormous amount of resources in order to convince every individual payer in the country separately that they should cover or not cover any given intervention or test or whatever it may be. It's an incredibly inefficient process that leads to highly variable outcomes that by definition can't be evidence-based because they have different thresholds and criteria and in some cases, as you know, they are not always based on the science, but they are based on the cost of the intervention. Um, and therefore, um, just bringing a little bit more clarity, a little bit more uniformity to that. Not necessarily a hard black and white, you know, quality threshold like you, you have in the UK, but even, even a little bit more consistent database of which evidence should be used to make those decisions would be a step in the right direction from the current true, uh, true wild, wild west that exists for coverage policy determinations. So your argument is the drug maker, the device maker, the diagnostic maker might actually like this because there's, there's one body that they need to demonstrate cost effectiveness to, and then uh, less evidence needed for all the individual insurers. I'd be okay if it was more evidence needed, to be honest with you, David, but here is the current, a current problem that I have. There's no clarity ahead of time what level of evidence is going to be needed to convince any given payer um, what it takes to gain coverage. And if they say you need another study and then you go and you spend an enormous amount of money to produce that study and go back and said, we did the study and guess what? It showed statistical significance and clinical significance and doctors say it changes their practice of medicine and it improves outcomes then it's very easy to say, oh, but the N wasn't large enough, or I can't generalize it to some other specific population. And so that you, there's this endless game of you, of you don't know what it takes to gain coverage. You do the things that you think it takes, but then if that's not enough, there's, there's continued obscurity over what then the next thing is. And if there was just a little bit more clarity overall for what the methodology, what the pathway, what the burden of evidence may be, I think it would be, it would actually massively accelerate the pace of innovation in the country because the rules would be a little bit more clear and you wouldn't have people slowing down potential innovations because of the fear of the time and resources it would take to do the studies necessary to meet a, a, a threshold that is not predetermined and is not known in the industry. Brian, the next segment is overrated or underrated. <laughs> okay. It's a concept I stole from Tyler Cowan. I believe you're familiar uh, with Professor Cowan's work. Great economist, yes. Uh, I'll name an item and you'll say whether it's overrated or underrated and you can pass. So first item, overrated or underrated? Duke basketball. Oh, that's not fair. We're in a pandemic and I'm already afraid that we may not even get a full, a full season this fall, although the NBA is perhaps successfully doing its bubble, bubble playoff now. Uh, Duke basketball, I would say in spite of all of its glory and awesomeness, it's still underrated uh, because if you think of it beyond just basketball, Coach K, of course, uh, in the Pantheon, maybe greatest of all time up there with John Wooden and others. But if you look at the program he's built, not just for the greater Durham community, but even if you look at the things that some of the graduates of the program have done post Duke and even post NBA, I think speaks to the true nature of the program he's built and the fact that he does consider them family. And he has all of the quotes about how when he's recruiting, you know, a 16 year old, a 17 year old, he's looking at the whole family, how committed they are and whether it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, a young man that he thinks he can shape into a good person first. And in addition to being a great basketball player. So I think it's underrated. Okay, good. So you got the first one correct. So well done. <laughs> so overrated or <laughs> overrated or underrated reading medical journals. Oh, okay. Uh, apologies to all of my colleagues out there. I think it's massively overrated. And here's why. Uh, 
first of all, physicians are often not trained to read them appropriately in medical school or training. It's pretty haphazard. Um, you know, th there's such a um, there is such an incentive for the authors of those papers to produce bulk volumes of them rather than a small number of really highly impactful and valuable ones. And but in and um, and many you know while most professors read lots of them, actual practicing physicians who are out seeing patients 100% of their time have very little time, don't subscribe to them, and don't get the best of them. But the real problem for me is that the learning is completely asynchronous, meaning you may sit on a Sunday afternoon and read a couple of really interesting medical journal articles and pontificate about the p-values of the paper that you just read, but you may not see a patient who actually fits the profile of that paper for another month. Are you going to accurately and adequately recall the right conclusion from that paper then? So it's the asynchronicity of it that makes me think we need to move to a dramatically more kind of AI algorithm driven um, help at the point of care, if you will. And just think of the difference between lawyers and doctors, which always fascinates me. You know, lawyers will spend thousands of hours on one case, um, uh, which not always isn't always that terribly complicated when you get down to the legal principle involved. Whereas, you know, doctors bounce from seven minute visit to seven minute visit, making these unbelievably complicated decisions, and they have no choice but to rely on whatever heuristics are already ingrained in them and whatever kind of routines and patterns they have. There's almost never time for them to do real case-based research or look up a couple of articles or, or, or look up a good reference and resource at the point of care or at the point of decision making, even if it's not with the patient in front of them. And, um, and so I think the current method of you know, thousands and thousands of different medical journals floating around uh, does not serve the medical community well because it makes them all feel like they're not up to date because they can't be because no human being could read them all. And so many of them are duplicative and frankly non impactful that it's really hard to figure out which ones are the ones you should dedicate your time to read. And then most importantly, how is that going to change your clinical practice once you see a patient that uh, that it would be relevant for so Next item. Oh, apologies to anyone watching who spends their career writing lots of those uh, medical, writing those medical journals. And your answer surprised me a little bit because you're a pretty voracious reader of medical journals, but I guess that means you know the flaws of these, you know, you know their warts, and I appreciate your honesty about it too. My, my main problem, particularly back when I was helping train uh, medical residents and fellows was, um, you can have a very elegantly and well-written medical journal article that demonstrates statistical significance, but has absolutely no clinical significance for real patients in the clinic. And it's that translational aspect of it that I think the journals don't adequately make that we need to apply other methodologies, other systems, other ways of making it realistic and impactful for an actual doctor who's just seeing patients all day long trying to gut through a busy clinic. Would it make any difference to have a paragraph on the front, what this means for this type of practicing physician? Is that useful or is it not that simple? Oh, that's a really, that's a good point. So actually quite a few of them now do a similar thing like key highlights or key takeaways, the Mayo Clinic Proceedings and the Cleveland Clinic Journal and a few others do that now. I think for the busy clinician who definitely isn't going to read the actual article, and used to just read the abstract and would get lost in the methodology section, could now read that and perhaps learn a little nugget that would be useful for their practice. So I think that's a great step forward. Does it fix the, the whole problem? Not in my opinion, but it's definitely an improvement. Good, and, and more, but more, you, you mentioned artificial intelligence. So more tools from AI to help the physician today uh, know the state of science. I think that as well as to incorporate all of the history that exists. So now electronic medical records have so much information in them that if you go to a new doctor, there's literally a 0% chance that that doctor would ever have the time to look through your comprehensive history and pull out potentially relevant things from years past. It's simply not possible. And so we're going to have to have computer assisted methodologies of 
of pulling what is possibly useful um, to, to pull that forward. And then also to incorporate what is known, and in particular what is known, whether it be a lab value, an imaging scan, a diagnosis, a uh, failed treatment from another doctor in another place, to pull that forward and inform the current diagnosis that any given doctor is making, and then the treatment plan and management plan that they make going forward. There are several attempts in Silicon Valley of doing something like this right now. Uh, they're currently a little bit clunky, but <clears throat> as you know, with all disruptive innovations, they'll get massively better over time. And augment the physician. I don't think, at least in my, in my career, uh, we're not going to be replacing physicians with AI, um, but I think we can dramatically improve their diagnostic ability, particularly with image-based things like radiology and pathology scans, which I'm um, very involved in right now. And then also in even the softer aspects of um, history taking and, uh, and looking at the history of patients through their, their records. Overrated or underrated? Accountable care organizations. <laughs> I'm gonna be careful here, uh, but still say they're overrated. Um, uh, for, uh, for, and really uh, stems back to a few of the things I've said earlier. Um, it's, the, it's a great idea. It's exactly what we need to do. The problem is we don't have good goalposts yet. We, is our goal just to reduce the per capita spending, in which case we could just reduce unit prices of things and call it a day. Um, if our goal is to improve quality outcomes, we need better clarity on what that actually means. And is that from the patient standpoint, from the doctor standpoint, or from the payer standpoint? Um, and so that, that's a little bit problematic for me. And then I think another is if the goal is to reduce either the rate of growth in healthcare spending or the absolute value of spending, we've now created a completely new industry in healthcare, which are all the intermediaries and the analytics companies and the population health management companies and all of the other companies that are in that intersection between the payer and the provider and sometimes the patient that then has to be paid for performing all of these functions to carry out what ACOs are trying to do. And yet still net a savings at the end of the day in order to do it. The other tricky thing is, and, and I've been on both sides of uh, accountable care organizations, is um, if the goal is to reduce the amount of spending for either the patient or the end payer, which in most cases is either a government employer or a taxpayer. <laughs> but, you've, but then you've got the provider and others doing these activities in order to propose supposedly save money. You're asking providers to do a whole lot of extra work in order to cut their pay. And in order to not cut their pay, you say that you want to share savings with them which really, if your goal was to cut the end user, the patient or the payer's costs, you're, you're giving half of what was saved back to the provider for doing a bunch of extra stuff. So, and then, and, then, and then what is the benchmark next year and the year after? Is it to continue cutting or do they then go on to some sort of a, a cost of living adjustment, which would mean you've reset, you've reset the cost initially, but then it's just gonna continue going up at the same rate of inflation it was before. There's just a whole lot of, of, of challenging issues, which is why they've, they've flourished in some places. There are some, some rays of sunshine, but there are some um, places where I think we need continued improvement in the model in order to make sure we're actually agreeing on what the goal is and then carrying out the functions to achieve those. Final question, overrated or underrated? Baseball. <laughs> Uh, well, apologies to my three teenage sons who love baseball, but I think uh, we are in such a multitasking, attention deficit, stimulation-seeking world right now that I think um, the days of spending four or five hours watching a, a lazy baseball game in the sunshine are probably behind us. So I would say it's probably overrated because it just doesn't fit the current American lifestyle the way it used to. Or at least I personally wouldn't necessarily choose to go uh, sit at a baseball game or watch one on TV uh, when there are so many other faster paced, fun things to do. It's sad, it's, you know, the national pastime, it's kind of like the, the slow decline we're seeing in golf because it's such a, um, it takes such a long time to play golf. My guest today has been Dr. Brian Cavaney. Thank you, Brian. Thanks so much, David. I enjoyed it very much.